Um, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Continue with our Gospel of Mark. And we are looking particularly today at the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, I don't know if you've ever um, wanted to hear a voice from heaven speak to you, but I, but I want to know um, what it would be like if it was a stern, firm, loud, and unmistakable rebuke. Uh, I mean, it, it would almost demand the it would demand the attention of it. And one of the things that we see here in our passage today is that that's pretty much exactly what happens. Um, I know that we've talked in the past about this dreaded disease of shoe and mouth syndrome, where sometimes you have to eat the whole whole front end of a rubber boot. It's not always pleasant, and Peter has to do that. And not only is the Lord Jesus rebuking him time and again. But you actually see that come from the Father in heaven, too, where he says these words to listen to him. Listen to him about what he's about to say, because it could be for your benefit, for God's glory, but yours as well as his people. So we've touched on chapter verse 1 of chapter 9, but we'll read it just for a little bit of context, and we'll read down to verse 13. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. But after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led him up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we hear the words of life from our Savior, that we would indeed listen to them. And that the words that he speaks would be the meditation of all of our hearts. So Lord, I ask that you will help us in that, to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you remember the 1989 film movie called Glory. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, and I don't know if you've watched it. Uh, but I have a couple of times, and it's a movie that it talks about this regiment, this military regiment in the Union Army during the, around the Civil War, or if you're a native of, the, of South Carolina, you would say the war between the states. Now, the reality of this regiment, though, is it's rather a unique one in the sense that this movie is talking about the development of an all-black military regiment in the Union Army. At the time, the, the Union Army was, was still in conflict with, with the South in the Civil War. And one of the things that ended up happening that is happening in the story of this, uh, of this troop was that they were a, a group of soldiers, former slaves or freedmen, who had been enlisted in the Union Army. But one of the parameters around it at the time was that they weren't able to actually take up arms in the Union forces. But eventually they were able to, and they were led by a white colonel named Bernard Shaw, 
And they came down into South Carolina at Fort Wagner on the coast around, I think it's Charleston, maybe. And so one of the things that they did that they did was that they were actually designed in purpose. They were finally given arms to be able to go forward. But they, when they were given those arms to actually fight in battle, they were actually used by the Union soldiers, by the Union intelligence to actually deal with the brunt of the fighting so that it would make fighting easier for the soldiers that would come later. So in their first field of battle, they actually went out as an entire unit to Fort Wagner, and they lost quite – as expected, they lost half of their fighting force, well over half. Many were injured or lost. Many did not come back. And in fact, their, their colonel himself, Colonel Shaw himself, was killed at Fort Wagner. But what ended up happening out of, out of the end of that conflict was Abraham Lincoln had actually heard of their bravery – and instead changed the, the uh, rules of military conflict to where now not only could black soldiers be enlisted, but they could also bear arms and go into fighting. He rewrote how the game was played as far as military enlistment was concerned. And he did that, and they also played it, played their role into that, not for re believing that their glory would be in winning on the field of battle. They had no intention of believing that their glory was winning at Fort Wagner. But the glory that they had in mind as far as what they were looking forward to was progress more generally, progress for black soldiers, suffrage, and, and the whole nine yards that culminated in the end of segregation many years later. And also really the main goal at that time in the 1860s was the end of slavery. That was their glory. That was their purpose. They weren't concerned about a particular battle as much as they were about winning the war. You've heard the statement before don't get lost in the forest for all the trees. They weren't able to do that. And I just have to ask y'all that question about what's your glory as well. What is your glory? What do you have your eyes and heart set upon? Glory for what you can, can maintain or build for yourself on this side of heaven, or are you looking forward to the day of Christ Jesus where that glory, where your his glory will be your glory, where your faith will be made sight and you can actually see him? Are you getting lost in the forest for all the trees? Are you concerned about the present battles of life in order to that it distracts you from the greater goal of winning a final conflict ultimately with sin and death? What are you necessarily looking for? Are you looking for the privileges that come with this life or the one that is to come? And all of those issues I just named are addressed for us in our text here today. We are in the second half of Mark's gospel, and so one of the things that's going to continuously resurface again is not just the, the hope of heaven, but mainly the road to get there. Jesus is going to talk here today and more throughout the rest of this gospel, the path, the way in which he has to walk in order to make it to where you can enjoy that same glory within the glory of God the Father, that where you can you can dwell with him for all eternity, where he would be your God and you be his people. The way is self-denial. We looked at that the last time I was up, and here today that that is centering on the issue of suffering, particularly with Jesus' suffering. But he endures that because of the glory that is to come. And the interesting thing about this passage is that it is is that it gives us a display, it gives us a taste of that glory here now with Jesus' transfiguration. Now Mark's gospel is not the only is not the only gospel which recounts it. In Mark, it's here in Mark 9, it's also in Luke 9, it's also in Matthew 17. Luke chapter 9 gives us particular uh, things that Matthew nor Mark actually include. And when we get to them here in this passage, we'll talk about it. But I want you to think about what the passage is actually teaching us today and that it's not just simply for Jesus, but it's also for you as well, that your road to glory entails suffering, but it has glory in view. Your road to glory entails suffering, but it has glory in view. And we're gonna, and I want you to think about that in two ways, beginning at verses two to eight, where that you will one day behold Christ's glory, but that also what we'll see in verses nine to thirteen, you will endure suffering along the way. We will one day behold Christ's glory, but it will entail suffering along the way. 
And when we look at that first idea in verses 2 to 8, we want, we want to also recognize the privilege Christians have in being able to see that glory. It is a privilege that we see in verses 2 to 4. And we know that that's the privilege that we have because of what we see in verses 2 to 3. If you look at it, after six days that, they are, that they're doing this, he only takes up with him three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Those are names that they that are that form in the Bible. Jesus is inner circle. They were among the first disciples that Jesus called. They are going to be with Jesus to the very end. Peter himself is actually going to be with Jesus at least close to the end. John, the apostle, is going to be with him even closer to the end, where he goes with his mother Mary up to the cross, where Jesus is being crucified. And not only that, do they get does he take this inner circle? He takes them high up the mountain by themselves. So it's Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And then wonder of wonders. You see what see this language here of Jesus being transfigured in verse three. They get to see this privilege of Jesus being transfigured before it. And look at how they describe this transfiguration, where it says such that that he was so intensely white that no one on earth could bleach them. Quite literally, he, what he's talking about, it's like, you know, you take your clothes to the laundromat, right? And you want them to bleach them. You want them to wash them. You want them to tear them. And he's like, I want this. You know, you have a, an old, dirty white shirt. It might be your favorite white shirt. I don't know. Uh, and you take it to the laundromat to say, hey, well, I want you to, to make this as white as possible. And they throw all the chemicals at it. They throw bleach. They throw everything at it to make sure that it gets to be as white as possibly can be. And what Jesus is and what Mark is describing here for us is that, that there is no way in which anybody could ever make it so bright. It was like, you know, the, 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 the brightness of the sun. How many of you look up at the sun and can actually see it? Nobody. The radiance and the brightness of it is such that you cannot see. And even that is even pales in comparison, like to the glory, to the absolute glory, the beauty and the shiningness of what Jesus' glory is is in himself. He was transfigured. The word actually is where we get our words for metamorphosis, where there's a there's a change of one thing to another. But I want us to think about this, that when Jesus came down on the earth, he didn't somehow lose any of that glory. It was still his. He was the divine son of God. He never lost it. And what we see here in this image, as it were, is as if Jesus's earthly human body gives way to the heavenly glory that he still possesses in and of himself. It's angelic. It's better than anything anybody could ever see. It's hard to even imagine or describe. And even what we're seeing here in Mark chapter 9, it is virtually indescribable other than what we can maybe latch onto with our own minds about a launderer not even being able to uh, blot out a perfectly white shirt or to clean, rather, a perfectly white shirt. The privilege that Jesus gets them to see is because these are going to be his inner circle because they are going to one day see him as radiant and as beautiful as anybody else could possibly imagine. They're spending time with Jesus. They're seeing him in some veil as he is in and of himself. And not only that do we see Jesus' radiance and glory, but we also see two people with him. In verse 4, we see that he appeared with Elijah. He appeared to them, Elijah, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, Mark doesn't say exactly what they were talking about. And, you know, I don't know about you if you've ever seen conversations in the past where you're like, I would, you know, I would love to be a fly on that wall for that interaction that's about to happen. Uh, but we actually do know what Jesus was, uh, what Jesus and Elijah and Moses were talking about. Luke chapter nine reports that they were talking about his death and the manner of his death, something that was about to come. But they're also getting a taste of what's going to be on the other side of that—that that privilege that all Christians have, that the way in which they can enjoy that fully is by suffering, Jesus's suffering. And that's our privilege to be able to see him as he is and to be with him and to one day to one day behold him. But that also has to to know that privilege. It has to be left with an imprint upon you as well to have that imprint 
of what it means to have actually beholden the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. So I want us to ask this question today as we, as we think about it, is that how does our lives reflect our walking with the Lord? How do our lives behold the glory of the Lord? It doesn't leave you unchanged. I mean, you sit, think about it. I mean, you, sit, you, you come to worship every week. We do a lot of the same things over and over and over again. But when, we, but, when we, but when we come to worship, are we simply thinking about, you know, we're just doing the same thing. We know what the right words to say. We know how to do it. We know how to do this. We know how to do that. But are we not sitting back thinking about how I am coming into the Lord's house? I am being impressed with his glory, hearing from his word. Hearing what he has to say. To behold his glory, not just in the word, but even in the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, the baptism, and all of that. To to, to know that this is at one point or other, this Jesus was a real human person who came to bear the sins of all the world. And your sins and my sins. Our lives manifest of having actually met with him. Of having been with him. Having heard from him. Him. I mean, you think about it. I mean, the, the parallel passage here today, a lot of scholars typically agree that the parallel passage to this Mount of Transfiguration is actually found in Exodus chapter 33, where the people are hearing from the Lord's voice and they say, do not let us hear any more of it lest we die. That's how it what with the impression that it left on the people of Israel. It was such that Moses was, was such a holy and righteous man. I mean, you, you read the end of Deuteronomy, and he says, and I, I think it might be Joshua who edited that, but that's probably for another topic another day. But it ends with saying that Moses was perhaps the most humble man that ever walked the face of the earth. And Moses himself was able to ask the Lord, Lord, let me see your glory. And what does the Lord respond, if you remember the passage? No man can see my glory. And live. No man can see my glory and live. But I'm going to give you this privilege, Moses. I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock, and I'm going to let you see some of my glory. Quite literally, the Hebrew means his hindquarters, what the back of God. He couldn't see the full glory of God, but he gave him a the privilege of being able to see even some of it. And you know what the impression was that it left on him. His face radiated with such glory that it had to be that it had to be for the remainder of his life veiled for all the people to see. And that's just seeing only a part of God's glory. What kind of impression does meeting with God leave upon you in your life? Does it emanate? Does it radiate? Does it have to be something like, I know who their Redeemer is. I know who their Savior is. I know who they are. And if they're not someone like, you know, just Dale or, or, or Vicky or anybody else. We're Christians. We believe in Christ. We walk with him. We behold in his glory. And it leaves that impression of people who have actually encountered and met with him there, just like the apostles are doing here, just like Moses did in the Old Testament. And that glory will inevitably shine forth. But it only shines forth in those who have sincerely repented and believed and trusted in Christ alone for their salvation, him and him alone. And that is the privilege. But the second thing that we need to know is that we need to regard the instructions about receiving it. Because when we look at verses 5 to 8, we get some degree of instructions. Now we see who Jesus actually is talking to, Elijah and Moses. And in verse 5, Peter says, verses 5 and 6, Peter, we see him struggle with that shoe and mouth syndrome again. Where he says, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. It's really good. Let us now uh, make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I mean, Peter, come on, really? I mean, why would you want to do that? Why would you be, sh- why would you be shutting off God's glory from, from all people to see? It's like you, you, you don't understand what you're saying. And in fact, Mark even admits that because in verse 6 he says, For he didn't know what else to say, for they were terrified. And you can say, you know, I don't don't, don't know about any of you, but there are just some things in life that you behold that there's there's really not a whole lot to say. It's just kind of awe-inspiring, and you you just don't always say a whole lot to it. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess that many of you, maybe not all of you, but some of you may or may not have ventured up to the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. But just, just for me and participation purposes, how many of you have actually been able to do that? You go up to Washington, D.C. All right. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? In a lot of ways, aside from the politics, but it is a beautiful place. Um, I mean, you see all these monuments, you see the White House, you see the Washington Memorial, you see all the cherry trees, the Japanese trees, you see all the natural and architectural beauty that it is. Now, imagine you were to take somebody up there with you who'd never been up there before, and they were able to say something along the lines of, it's just a building, what's the big deal? Now, if they were American, you'd probably wonder if they're actually American citizens anymore, like, can we not actually revoke some of that? Um, but even still, you'd look at that and be like, how can you not be taken away from, taken aback by the sheer magnitude and, and the, the greatness that, that really is the city of Washington, D.C.? I mean, it, it's, it, for, all, for all of its warts and, and, uh, and everything, it's still a rather remarkable city. And so to, to come back and say, well, then what's the big deal would just kind of be um, ill-timed at best, ill-placed. Probably not something I would say. And so what's then something you wouldn't say if you were actually beholding the transfiguration? Let's make a tent for you, Elijah, and Moses. That's pretty much the, the sort of thing that you're kind of getting here. But as is so often the case, Jesus is patient in his teaching, but he's also still rebuking him. Where we see here in verses 7 to 8, another rebuke coming down to him from heaven. You look at verse 7, the cloud that overshadowed them, we remember the cloud from Exodus 19 that covered Mount Sinai, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This is my beloved son, listen to him. This is my beloved son, listen to him. I mean, you could imagine like the, 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 the weight of being able to hear that and the loudness, the like it would almost make you, it would almost knock you down to your knees if you weren't hearing it. I mean, that, that sort of glory is the very th reason why in our passage that some people couldn't ascend up the mountain with Moses. It was too awesome. It was the reason why the people in Israel in Exodus 33 said we can't hear any more. It was too awesome. It was why in Revelation chapter 1, when John, the, the, the writer of the, of the Revelation, when he actually saw the glorified Christ, when he actually saw Jesus as he was, he fell down on his knees because he didn't have anything else to do but to worship. And what the Heavenly Father is coming down saying, this is the second time we've had in this gospel a, uh, a voice come down from heaven and say, this is my beloved son, anointing Jesus as such. But he's speaking to you and to Peter saying, listen to him. Stop talking and just listen. Just listen to him for one minute. And what happens after all of this interview is that in verse 8, Jesus is looking, they're looking around and they no longer saw anyone except these key words, except Jesus only. I want us to think about some of, some of this here today, uh, particularly as it comes to beholding and listening to the voice of our Savior and beholding his glory and listening to what he actually says. Because the reality of the situation is the way in which we receive the instructions that the Father has for us is by these simple words, listen to him. But I have to ask us these questions, especially as I was meditating on it yesterday about those words, listen to him and only seeing Jesus. Because where I want us to know and to think about where in our lives uh, is Jesus rarely, if ever, solely in view as we go through our day-to-day -day affairs? Are we thinking in terms and listening to Jesus' instructions in our affairs? I think these questions can cover almost anything and may not necessarily seem particularly helpful on the surface. But I want us to think about what Jesus' will is in governing our church, our families, or our work. Are we listening to the voice of the Savior? Are we listening to Jesus when he says not to worry or be anxious about what we can't control when it comes to health or personal care, how to support our friends or family or our future employment? 
What are we saying when we try to steer and control people and events into things that we want them to do? Our sense of control and needing to be leading in every venue of our lives does not enable them to be run well. Think about that. If we want to control our lives and our future and everything else that it might be, and those of others around us as well, how well do we think it will be if Jesus is not our king and he's not solely in view? Jesus only is the king of his church in our lives. And unless he governs how we go through those daily affairs, how we worry, how we lead our lives, and how we govern ourselves, how we're anxious about this or that or not at all, how do we expect to invite him in his blessing? If we are consistently, if he's telling us one thing and we're doing another. When we take his teachings to heart and recognize the privilege that we have as Christians to have it, not only will we have his blessing on this side of glory, but we can look forward to that ultimate glory that we'd have one day of being with him and seeing him as he is, where we listen to his instruction, when we listen to his words. And so when he says, don't worry, be anxious for nothing, let it, let tomorrow be anxious for itself. As hard as it is, and hard as it is not to worry, especially when there are so many things that but beleaguer us from health concerns, friends in in trouble, friends in sickness, friends passing away. Do we really trust him and his providential care for us to when he says, be anxious for nothing, do we listen to him? Do we also listen to him when when he talks about the way of salvation as well? Jesus has told us what the way of salvation is. It's through self-denial. It's through self-sacrifice. It's through humility. The last shall be first. The great. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Doesn't he say that? Where he says, my way is to take up my cross and anyone who wishes to follow me must do the same. It's not like it's humility. It's the base of it is that true humility where Jesus says, It's not so much thinking of ourselves less, but thinking of others more. And that Jesus let go of everything that was his and his alone, that he didn't have to let it go. And he let it all go to come down on earth to die for you and for me. That's the model. That's the path that he tells us to listen to. And it is a path of self-denial that's not natural to us. It isn't natural. And yet the privilege at the end of it will be that one day we see him in glory. The second thing, though, that I want us to think about is that not only will we behold Christ's glory one day, but that we'll also have to endure some degree of suffering along the way. And as we look at that, we see that in particularly in verses 9 to 13. But I want us to think about this, too, that suffering is not unique to the Son. It's not unique to him. Look at verses 9 to 10. And as they were coming down the mountain, they, this is Jesus only, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, questioning about what this rising from the dead might mean. There are a lot of things that are going on here. Uh, in particular, this fact that they were, that as Jesus is saying, you know, don't tell anybody what you saw until I rise, until the Son of Man rises again. He's speaking of himself. They're questioning and debating that in themselves. It's like they're disputing it. They're, they're, it's like they're saying, you know, uh, this Jesus, Jesus, we, we accept that you're the Messiah, but we're still not sure yet that you actually have to die. I mean, we're, we're, we're still really disputing that within ourselves. But I want you to think about this as well, because Jesus is going to time and time again repeat this for refrain about his own suffering. And that's going to dominate the entirety of the next chapter. But one of the things that he does here is he says, tell no one what you saw, but he does something unique here that he's not done before. And that's this. Tell nobody what you've seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Now, in, uh, in about as many chapters as we've gotten so far into nine chapters, Jesus has consistently told people at least once per chapter not to tell anybody what you have seen. He does that because they don't understand. He does that because it's not time to tell everybody what to do. But Jesus here for the first time and the last time when he says, tell nobody what you've seen, he puts time constraints on it, doesn't he? He says, not until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
There is going to be a time for you to tell everybody what you've seen and done, but that time's not now. Before we get there, I must suffer. Before we get there, I must die on the cross. And they're disputing that within their minds. Jesus is saying this isn't unique to me, but it is not but it is something that he's never done before, as like as, even as far as the incarnate Son of Man is concerned. I mean, Jesus has never endured that kind of suffering, at least until he was incarnate. But he does that for you and for me. And what Jesus is pretty much saying in here is like, this is my road, just as it's your road. And so it's not unique to me. So there's no real reason to question or debate in yourselves, Jesus is telling them, about what I must do, because you must be able and ready to do the same. But by a subtle shift of the conversation, they begin to, in verse 11, to, to shift the conversation away from that, around the uniqueness of Jesus' suffering. And they begin to ask him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And what we're getting from this final section is the fact that suffering's also, while it's not unique for the Son, it's also not unique for God's people. And we get that particularly in verse 13, but we have to see it as it unfolds in this particular way. Why does Elijah come first? This is getting into Jewish eschatology, which is the idea of you know, the study of the last things, about what's going to happen before Messiah comes. And what Jesus is pretty much saying here to, to them, or what rather they're saying to Jesus is, okay, well, we're going to change the subject, Jesus. Well, you're not going to suffer. It's okay. But uh, why does Elijah come first? This is a constant Old Testament prophecy from Malachi chapter 4, where they actually say that Elijah will come first. He'll restore all things. For him to restore all things is pretty much to prepare the people for the salvation that's going to come. He's pretty much telling them, you know, hey, these are the things that are going to happen before the Son of Man comes. Um, you know, it's like they had an incomplete eschatology, as it were, as they were coming. Because back in, you know, back in the day, a lot of people wanted to know everything there was to know about the end times. Now, I don't know if any of you have actually heard of or remember it, but how many of you guys remember the the Left Behind series or the late Great Planet Earth and and the uh, the apocalyptic fiction that it was? How, how many of y'all remember that? All right, so like we were like, I mean, like I I just remember this growing up. We were like enamored with what was going to happen. I mean, if you remember the Le uh, Left Behind series, you remember, you know, Nikolai Carpathia from Romania. He's going to rise up. He's going to take over the UN. He's going to settle peace in the Middle East miraculously for seven years and then break it. And then all hell will break loose. I mean, quite literally. I mean, if you remember that, um, you know, th this was how we understood complete eschatology. Yet, as far as it goes, I mean, I don't believe that, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that the, the whole point of it is ultimately to see our blessed hope, which is Jesus, not necessarily to be focused about what's going to happen along the way. Because the Word's already told us what's going to happen along the way. And one of those is, is that Elijah's going to come, what, come the way to restore all things, but to prepare you for me. So they're asking him that to change the subject. Why is Elijah come first to then say in verse 12, look what Jesus says. <laughs> He does come, but how also is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? I mean, what he's saying is like, you're right. Elijah does come first. He does come to restore all things because in their minds, you know, they, they, they've just seen Elijah stand with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And they're thinking, OK, well, now is the time come. Who is how is this going to happen? And Jesus says, yeah, Elijah's come first. But how about the writings of the Son of Man? All of the stuff that they had prophesied is also pro about him is also true of me. Go back and read your Bibles. What does it say in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, immediately after the fall? What would the seed of the woman do? Crush the serpent's head, even though the serpent would bruise his heel. What does it say in, in the Psalms? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, it talks about the suffering servant of Israel, where it says he was smitten by God, stricken and afflicted. His people didn't esteem him not. They killed the Son of Man, and, they were said, and it was said that they were going to do it. Anybody with any sense of having read their Bibles in Jesus' day would have known that. 
And they have this incomplete eschatology where they don't have, have any view, any place for this idea. We only see glory. We don't see suffering. We see glory when the Messiah comes. We see glory when Elijah restores all things. We don't see this talk of suffering. And yet what Jesus is telling them time and time again, all of that is true, but this is true, and this is how we get there, and that is through my sufferings. It's through my pain. And not only that does Jesus then say this in verse 13. He says, but I tell you this, Elijah has come. Uh, how's he come? But they did whatever they did. They did whatever they pleased as it is written. So it was written that he would come. It's also written that they would do to him whatever they wanted, like all of the Old Testament prophets before. Now, who's this Elijah? It's John the Baptist. He's equating John and Elijah together to pretty much say that what happened to John, what would happen to Elijah was true of John. John did come. He did prepare all the people for Christ. And they missed the memo. John knew. But what did it get John? He got him arrested. He got him beaten. He got him flogged. It had his head taken off. They quite literally did to him whatever they wanted. The people of God heard the word of God and they rejected him. From the man, they heard the word of God. The people of God heard the word of God from the man of God, and they rejected it. They rejected it completely out of hand. But I want us to think about that once more for a second about how do we receive the word of God as well? How do we receive the man of God? How do we receive the people of God? And I just want us to think about this as well. Well, why don't we receive it better? I mean, I think all of us would consider ourselves Christians, and we, we, we come and we hear the word every Sunday, or even maybe in our daily lives, and we can always simply say, well, I can receive it better, but why don't we? Why don't we often receive these words of salvation better about what Christ has done? And I think it's because oftentimes we can say, we can, we can, we can say we receive, we receive these words with gladness, but it almost feels kind of dull and rote. I mean, whenever you approach the Word, whenever you approach the Bible, whenever you approach worship, whenever you approach uh, anything that Christians would ordinarily do, how do you approach it? Do you do it just simply because Christians do it? Or do you do it, li and, or do you do it like a little child? If you've ever seen a kid having his favorite dessert. You know, sometimes kids will, look, will pick out a favorite dessert. They'll pick out a favorite ice cream, and then, and then that's their dessert forever. I mean, they're, they're giddy every time they have it. It doesn't care, matter how many times they, they do it. They always love that one particular thing. I mean, this was true of, of my siblings and I when we were growing up with TV shows. I mean, we, we loved... Um, um, I, I remember my brother and sister. Uh, they really loved this old TV show called Barney. Uh, and when we were kids, it was always, it was Barney this, Barney that. And my parents would always tell us they would go absolutely bananas uh, every time they heard that theme song. I mean, it was, it drove them up the wall. But for us as kids, like, it was like, it was like the thing to do. Like, I mean, this was, this was great. I mean, we, we were, it's like we had never seen it before. We could see the same thing multiple times again. And we, and like the, 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 the thrill of it never actually went away. Do we receive the words of Christ in the same way that we're hearing from our Savior? Or do we receive it with dullness because we've heard it so many times before? Or maybe we're preoccupied with other things in the world that takes the joy away from us. Because whenever I would be to hear the words of the Savior, I would probably want to receive them better than I ordinarily do. And we should be receiving the words of salvation with gladness, like the little child, but we often don't receive them this way because of the dullness and preoccupation, or even preoccupation with worldly matters that have no bearing on our eternal salvation. Because if in receiving God's word of instruction, we shoot the messenger instead of the, mess instead of the messenger wrestling with it in the same way that had happened with Elijah, we become to think less about spiritual things which ought to bind us together and more about the quarrelsomeness which then divides us. Because in receiving the words of salvation, we ought to receive them as little children excited for a sweets or as Barney TV show, as an addict, as a, an addict would who's broken free of his addictions or someone who's finally seen that they are great sinners 
but Christ is a great Savior. Because in the end of it all, the truth of the matter is that our, we are on a road to glory. It might entail a lot of suffering. It might entail, it's not unique to God's people. It's not unique to our Savior. But one day we will behold his glory. And what's true of Jesus and the prophets is also going to be true of you. But for you today, the best thing that you can do is to be satisfied with your glorious saving God in Christ Jesus and by doing his bidding. The disciples were not told to say anything to anyone about what they saw until Jesus rose from the dead. Now we're on the other side. Jesus has risen from the dead. And so that you can go and do wherever you go, do and do what Jesus says in telling everybody of what you've seen and even heard here today. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we hear from your word that we would receive the words of salvation with gladness, knowing that it might often entail itself with a great deal of difficulty and pain. But I do pray, Father, that we will keep our eyes on King Jesus, who is our Savior and our King and our God. And I pray that you will help us to cling to him new day by day. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.